Well, thank you very much for uh, coming here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Andreas Hess, and I'm uh, from the UCD Sociology Department at the School of Sociology. Um, and I'm part of the organizing committee together with Daniel Fass from TCD. Uh, before I start, could I just draw your attention to the next event, which is on Tuesday, the 11th of November, at 7 o'clock, and we have Richard Wilkinson together with Kate Pickett, both from the University of London. Why income inequality damages us all. If you take a closer look at the websites uh, of both the TCD and UCD sociology departments, you will get uh, more detailed information there. It's a great honor to uh, have our guest speaker this late afternoon, Craig Calhoun from the London School of Economics. I don't want to uh, stand here too long and make long speeches, so I just want to give you just a brief introduction about Craig and uh, Craig's veto and his work. Craig holds um, a number of degrees, actually, uh, a master in anthropology and sociology from Columbia University and Manchester University, and a doctorate in sociology and modern social and economic history from Oxford. His first job was with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill between 1977 to 1996, uh, and he moved then to New York University for a chair in sociology almost until 2012, when he became the newly appointed director of the London School of Economics. He had various visiting appointments um, and has been awarded a number of times with, with prizes and awards. Amongst his books, uh, there are a couple of them um, that stand out. Uh, first of all, the ones you are probably most familiar with, uh, two on nationalism. Um, Nations Matter and Nationalism from 2001 and 2007, respectively. Then there is a, a book that uh, made quite a bit of headline, which is um, on China and the struggle for democracy, entitled Neither Gods Nor Emperors from 1994. There is, as some sociology undergraduates in the United States will know, a famous textbook, textbook uh, now through seven editions called Simple Entitled Sociology, and the latest republication, a book on the roots of radicalism with the University of Chicago Press from 2012. I find it, in preparation for giving this, this short introduction, uh, I thought, oh, I'll just uh, have a quick look at the CV and just print out and push the button for, for publications on the research information system, and was surprised uh, of 22 pages rolling out. So please forgive me if I don't mention uh, any particular uh, articles or chapters in books from those hundred and something publications. There are just too many uh, to do that. Uh, Craig's work has also been translated into a number of uh, half a dozen, actually half a dozen languages. I came across, while preparing for this little intro, I also came across a nice new theme uh, that um, is on the use on the uh, LSE website, and it goes like this, we must set high standards for ourselves, but in order to inform the public well, not to isolate ourselves from it. So I think this afternoon is a nice and good opportunity to do exactly that. The topic for this late afternoon is what threatens capitalism now. Craig will speak for about 50 minutes an hour, and then there will be some question time. Thanks, Andreas. If I speak for an hour, you should all start shouting at it. Stop me. That's too long. Um, in addition, I feel ecologically unsound. My CV is too long. Too many trees have suffered for this. On one of his walks through early industrial Manchester, Friedrich Engels, Marx's famous collaborator, for my money, the first urban sociologist, struck up a conversation with a fellow businessman. Engels pointed out pollution, the squalor in which workers live, the poor quality of housing, the lack of education for children, poor health, and problems of public order. Yes, says his companion. I see. 
Still, a lot of money is made here. This has been a core frame for thinking about capitalism and its consequences ever since. Capitalism generates wealth, and that is its primary point. We may dress it up with references to the virtues of private property, private enterprise, and competition, but fundamentally, this is why we like it when we like it. However, capitalism generates wealth in ways that lead to its unequal distribution. And this is a significant part of what Eccles was pointing out. That it leads to this unequal distribution, but lots of wealth, is still a reason why some people like it. But it is also a source of major social problems. And the problems derive not just from inequality, but in more basic ways from the very success of capitalism. A 19th century English writer, Ruskin, coined the term ilf to describe this. And I think that we have not incorporated well enough into our thinking this idea of ilf. Capitalism generates not just wealth, but ilf, not just good stuff, but bad stuff. The distribution of ilf is as unequal as the distribution of wealth. When we talk about social inequality, we usually talk about the distribution of wealth and or income. Who's making a lot of money, who has inherited a lot of money, who has wealth to command various social goods. But we should also pay attention to the unequal distribution of pollution, substandard education, and other bad things in life and incorporate this into our thinking. Now, in the wake of the recession that has been longer lasting than the Great Depression, if not quite as deep, we have to begin any conversation on capitalism by noting that it has not collapsed. Collapse does not seem imminent. On the contrary, capitalism has taken root in a range of places previously on the periphery of the capitalist world system, in Asia, for example, parts of Latin America and even helped to catapult some previously peripheral or semi-peripheral countries into the global core. So during the time of the recession, when we were noting near collapse of national economies, here for example, when we were noting the collapse of many people's businesses, the shuttered businesses with forced sale signs, it's not the case that capitalism collapsed. We'll never know, in a sense, how close it came to a large-scale collapse. But I want to begin by suggesting that we pay attention to the fact that it didn't. And so long as there is a widespread desire for growth, capitalism is likely to continue to organize much of economic life and a global world system. Of course, growth confronts potential limits, such as catastrophic climate change. And in asserting that capitalism is likely to remain dominant for some time, I am not asserting that it is eternal or that it is good, only that it seems still to be dominating global economics. Indeed, it may very well drive us into a point where climate change has become irreversible. So don't understand this suggestion that capitalism hasn't collapsed as an affirmation of the virtues of capitalism, only the strength. Moreover, the strength is rooted in this desire for growth. It's rooted in a long-standing pattern in which we organize both personal aspirations and public projects in terms of an idea of growth and gain traction on solving personal problems, on meeting personal ambitions, but also on dealing with public questions through growth. And we are relatively weak at dealing with those questions otherwise. What I'm suggesting is that in asking what threatens capitalism, how the challenges it faces and partially produces for itself can be met, and whether its ill effects can be mitigated should be a central focus for social scientists and for those who seek better society. In other words, capitalism, yes or no, isn't the most important question. We've got a capitalism, yes, situation. What do we do about it? 
what can mitigate ill effects, what can maximize good effects, what threatens it, and what are the options. If in the pursuit of growth we are also generating massive ilth, and if both wealth and ilth are wildly unequally distributed, it is crucial to ask about the mitigation of public bads and the generation of public goods. So running through this talk are the issue of some negative things that are public in the sense that they are shared, that they are intrinsically shared. I'll give you a quick example, we'll come back to war, right? Um, it is something that affects wide populations, not just those who make it happen. Okay. For pollution is a deeply shared public good. If there's massive air or water pollution, it affects everybody. Um, by the, so it's a public bad. Clean air, clean water, a public good. Now, can you be asked to pay more for a public good? Of course. Well, there's effort right here, right now, to get you to pay more for water. And we can ask right, a range of questions about the distribution of these public bads and public goods as well as the production of them. This is what I want to get into. So much of the question of capitalism today turns on the relationship between public bads and public goods, or the relationship between the production of these and the distribution. And often, a much narrower range of private actors who produce these things, and wider people who either suffer them or consume them. Capitalism, and they're, they're, this is organized in 10 points for what it's worth, so some of them are longer than others. Capitalism is a word we use um, and often without very deep understanding. Some people go very deeply into it. Interestingly, the critics much more likely than the proponents. So most subjects we study, the fans use the word more and study them more. This is one where it's more likely to be Marxist opponents of capitalism um, who go in detail. And the reason for this is in part that it is falsely universalized, that people who are supporters of broadly capitalist economics are aptly to think those are just economics and not need to use the word capitalism. They will say markets, they're universal. People, um, in their essence, truck and barter, as Adam Smith put it. But capitalism is not just markets and it's not just truck and barter, it's a more specific historical system. Um, I'm not going to, get to spend the whole talk trying to explicate this. But it is important to begin by recognizing it's a historical system. That's why it might end. It wasn't the way human beings were created. We haven't always been embedded in a capitalist society, and very likely we won't. All other historically created systems have at some point come to an end. This one may too. That said, it's not likely to be next week. <laughs> Moreover, though capitalism has systemic qualities, it's not a single system with a single master key. That is, it's not so tightly integrated that you can say that um, everything about it everywhere coheres, and there's one precise explanation. Rather, actual capitalism at any time and in any place is a mixture of more or less specific phenomena, each of which has historical context and potential to change. So it's important. Five are especially important. I'll be really quick about this because I don't want to just give a lecture on capitalism, but get on to what threats it. First of all, capitalism is structured by a logic of reinvestment in productive enterprise. Capital is wealth that is invested to create more wealth. This is key because this is what generates the continual expansion of the system, the more and more production and thus the threats to environment or depletion of natural resources or other things. It's also, though, what generates growth, the main thing that people want from capitalism, the main thing it's good at delivering. This can be accomplished by trade, industry, or finance, but in all cases, it is the logic of reinvestment and growth. Second, capitalism is characterized by markets that no single actor can control. Florentine banking, for example, 500 years ago, could be controlled by the Medici and a set of elites in a way that, in general, capitalist markets can't be. 
This doesn't mean that the language of free markets is entirely accurate. This is somewhat ideological, the notion that there's complete freedom in markets, but that nobody can completely control them is more or less essential to capitalism. Third, the autonomy, or at least partial autonomy, of business enterprises from political power has been basic to capitalism. I'm going to ask in a little bit if this um, is going to stay basic. What I mean by this is the idea that the accumulation of economic capital gets pursued as a goal in and of itself by businesses, rather than directly and immediately converted to political power. There have often been people pursuing economic wealth in the rest of human history and other settings, but more closely tied up with its conversion to political power. Capitalism is structured partly by some degree of separation, partial, between the two projects. It's not autonomous from politics. Firms and markets depend significantly on states, and they try to influence states, and states sometimes exert power on their behalf. But what doesn't happen is a simple collapse of the two together. Fourth, the use of finance to detach capital from specific enterprises is basic. Finance, credit, and monetary instruments of all kinds detach our investment from specific businesses. You can't ship a factory overseas very easily, but you can move the money that is behind it. And the world of debt and credit is thus basic and makes this much more fluid. Part of the story of the last few years of the economic crisis is precisely the story of how easily capital can move when it takes the form of finance and not the form of physical production facilities or other kinds of enterprises. And finally, the exploitation of free labor to productive employment in productive employment on behalf of capital is basic. In other words, we hire people, we don't own them as slaves. Um, and the um, exploitation of labor takes place in enterprises dedicated to returns on capital sufficient to compete for more capital and contribute to accumulation. Now that's it for what I want to say definitionally about this, and you can just sort of bracket that. I think almost everything else is understandable without going into that much detail. I want to get the pre. Capitalism has come in a, in a package of familiar institutional arrangements that can be easily taken for granted, I think are, and they are not all essential. They're contingent. They could change, and part of the story is going to be about this change. They reflect challenges that must be met, um, but not necessarily in these ways. So there are a series of ways in which people have developed a characteristic pattern of economic life, relations to the economic, to the political, and so forth, that could change, be significant. Let me just mention a few. The corporate form of business organization. This was not common. The idea of corporations as businesses was not common when Adam Smith wrote. Adam Smith, in fact, argued in The Wealth of Nations that it should be banned. Right? So the most famous canonical text of capitalism, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, says there should be no business corporations, no joint stock companies. So there should be no trade unions, and that's quoted often. The Financial Times, The Wall Street Journal repeat him. There should be no trade unions, but not there should be no corporations. His logic was the same in each case. The system would work only, and would work well in his account of the invisible hand, only if individuals were all equally subject to it. If they could form together in these kinds of enduring groupings, combinations as he called them, of either capital or labor, that would distort the system, it would prevent them each from being equally pressed to um, follow the rational logic of capitalism buying cheap and selling dear, learning from previous experience, being conditioned into good behavior. So the point here is that the corporation is a very basic part of capitalism as we experience it, but it's kind of a historical add-on, right? not essential to it, and it's very important. The corporation is organized in a way that could be a whole lecture here, but organized with ideas like limited liability for investors that the people who invest in the corporation can receive potentially unlimited profits from it, 
but they cannot be asked to pay costs beyond their initial investment. Even if the corporation does something like destroy a national economy or pollute a lake or a river, right? If the corporation cannot afford to clean it up, you can't ask its owners to, right? Legally, any legal system of the OECD. Um, you can bankrupt the corporation, they can lose their initial investment. Not. Now that's something that's actually an innovation. Right? It happens in US law, that's 1817, prior to 1817. In other words, not time immemorial, but a specific historical date, that this idea of limited liability comes in. The decision is a great court decision. Chief Justice, the US Supreme Court, writes that a corporation right, has not a body to kick, nor a soul to damn, right? And he goes on to talk about it as a kind of artificial person, a fictive creation that has legal rights. This is not ancient history, 1817. It's been echoed recently in the United States where the Supreme Court ruled that corporations have a right to free speech exactly the same as ordinary human individuals in the issues of citizenship and political campaigns. So we've got a history around corporations. We'll say a little bit more about it, although I'm not mainly going to talk about that. What I want to suggest is you could imagine this changing or this growing stronger. You could imagine a world in which capitalism becomes increasingly structured, even more than it is in terms of corporations, um, less in terms of nation states and so forth. You could imagine limits on it. A second historically contingent feature is open trade in both equities and financial instruments like bonds and potentially everything else. In other words, in what we see as the world of capital around us, there has been a historical process of making more and more subject to buying and selling. Okay? So that a whole variety of services that were, were provided by families historically become now commercial or professional relationships. And a whole variety of commodities, or a whole variety of things that were not commodities, but were understood as being in special categories that couldn't be sold openly, including certain kinds of land inherited in family lineages, now are bought and sold openly. As capitalism extends into other parts of the world, this is part of what happens, that um, more and more is put into the market. It means as it extends, say, in Africa, that a variety of places where there are traditional land rights that share rights to the land among many people may be abrogated in favor of the idea that the land can be sold once and for all and there's a dispossession of the larger group. Or as it expands um, on the fringes of India, the tribal areas, or in parts of Latin America, that the rights to such things as indigenous medical knowledge can be sold. So think about it. You can actually sell an intellectual property right that was never known to be an intellectual property right. It was just the way we cured people of certain diseases using certain um, natural products. Um, but this can be sold and then become the intellectual property right of a global pharmaceutical company no longer owned by the people whose indigenous knowledge it was. So there's a considerable um, expansionism in this open trade of all kinds, and it goes on all over. The third thing is the assumption by states of responsibility for economic infrastructure. In other words, governments, states, right, put lots of things in place for capitalism to work. Roads, for example. Right? Easier to get goods to market if there's a road, right? but who pays for the road? often the citizens through the state. Right? Lots of infrastructures of this kind. Most basically, money. Right? Money was not primarily issued by states during the Industrial Revolution. Right? Money was primarily issued by banks and not central banks of states. But this is a long and complicated history, as we know from Zimmel or others who've written about this, in which money has sometimes been specie, like gold and gold coins, and they might have the picture of the king on them or something. It became um, something controlled by new systems of banking, which grew out of merchant capital in the modern era, gave way to paper money, lots of resistance. Who wanted to get paper when you might have gotten gold? Right? The vast majority of money in the world now never takes any physical form not gold, not silver, not paper, 
It merely exists in computerized form. And most of it exists in the form of debt. That is, not in the form of simple positive, you have some, like I have about 80 pounds in my pocket, right? It exists in the form of collateral obligations. Somebody will pay me if I call it in. Okay? Now, states provide this infrastructure of money and the guarantees behind it for the most part, though it is partially escaping state control now um, in this world of new computerized money. But this is a matter of political organizations providing the basis for capitalist economic organizations. Remember, I said capitalist economic organizations are partially autonomous. So it's states providing the basis for organizations they don't control. They might regulate somewhat, but are able to act independently in a variety of ways in all of this. But the state provision goes way beyond this, controlling crime so that there's not a theft of the goods in your shop if you're a capitalist preventing invasions of the country, um, preventing, you know, minimizing risks to shipping on the high seas, all sorts of things that are provided. And the importance of this is that the intertwined nature of providing for prosperity on the basis of businesses and security and other goods through states and their mutual interdependence in all of this. And thus the extent to which nations and states are implicated in this capitalism, right? um, but not reducible to it. The fourth thing is liberal democracy. I'll say more about this because I think it's actually a danger here. Um, most, there's been a great deal of thought, I won't say most, hard to know who we're counting, but lots of thought uh, that assumes that capitalism, with its idea of private property and free markets, goes naturally together with democracy. This idea of the autonomy of individuals and freedom to vote and choose in government and so forth. So the idea of liberal democracy has been basic. And we can quibble over whether this has always been true. Right? A lot of cases of countries that remain capitalist without being very liberal and so forth. But it seems to be a trend. It's possible the trend is coming to an end, and I'll return to that. Uh, but it's a trend that we've mostly been pretty happy with in the West, saying, Yes, we can have more stuff, capitalism generating wealth, and more freedom, and they will go together. And liberal democracy will go together with economic freedom, and we will see both together um, in the same system. That isn't a law-like relationship. I want to suggest that's another of these historically contingent things. It's worked when it's worked. We should ask why it works, but we should ask whether it is a package that will be sustained. And I could go on and on about this. International agreements and conflict resolution. You might ask, why do we not use war to facilitate capitalist ends? Or put another way, when do we use war to facilitate capitalist ends? To what extent are Middle East crises governed by the issue of oil and the need for fuel to drive economies? To what extent are they governed by separable political considerations or other sorts of things? Um, we have a structure of terms of international agreements within which capitalism operates. Now, this is relevant partly because it could change. Right? It does change all the time. It changes repeatedly. And it shouldn't be assumed into the very idea of what the world is like that we live in without recognizing that it's been put in place somewhat historically and it can be changed rather dramatically. Now, a third point, and now this gets more and more contemporary as we go on. Crises are endemic to capitalism. We're in a massive crisis. I'm thinking you're informal enough that you won't mind if I take the jacket off. We're in a fairly large scale crisis now. It's lasted a long time. Growth is pretty anemic coming out of it. Right? The risk of another serious financial crisis actually remains substantial. Right? So we're not out of the woods here. On the contrary, during these years of financial crisis, we have done almost nothing globally to prevent the next one. We have not in any very significant way changed the global financial infrastructure or architecture. Almost all of the same threats remain. So the risk of another serious financial crisis is substantial in the short run, and it approaches 100% as you move towards the longer run. In the current crisis thus, as um, it has been said by a variety of people, we've wasted the will to change things. So almost nothing's been changed. 
we still face large-scale systemic risk. The first of the big threats to capitalism I want to talk about is systemic risk. It's this kind of thing happening again. Now, what kind of thing was that? Right? Well, most versions of systemic risk involve some combination of these things, and the current one involved all of them. Liquidity shortages is the inability to convert one kind of property into another fast enough to pay debts. So that um, the, the housing-backed securities market in the US was a prime example of this, um, in which mortgage securities, mortgages were sold to people. Right? Those were then used as collateral by banks to make other loans. And at some point, it became hard to cash them in fast enough right, for these to be paid off. I'm not going to take the time, come back and ask a question if you're wondering more about how mortgage-backed securities run. I'm not going to try to explain it. But the basic problem is, is if most of money, most of money in the world is held in some form other than cash, turning it into cash at any one moment could be really hard. And this is a technical problem. The very algorithms, the computer programs that are used to run most derivatives trading presume as a necessary feature of their mathematical operation unlimited liquidity. But there is never unlimited liquidity in real life. So there's always this potential threat. Secondly, those versions of systemic risk involve tight linkages. You've heard the expression too big to fail that was used to justify bailouts of banks and other kinds of opinions um, during the financial crisis. But really, too big to fail is slightly misleading. It's too connected to fail that is the issue. What drove bailouts was organizations that were so tightly interwoven with others, banks, investment banks and security trading firms and hedge funds and so forth, all interlocked with car countries and other things, interlocked in debt, interlocked in a web of mutual obligations. Right? Why was General Motors part of bailout at about the same time um, as Citibank? Right? The answer is that the credit business behind selling cars was basic to General Motors. It was generating more profit than selling cars. General Motors was making more money loaning people the cash to buy the cars than it was making from the cars. So it was actually partially a bank, and it was tightly interwoven with others in a system. And that's where this liquidity comes in. It's called um, linkages, but the various ways in which this is all knit together. right? And that's what creates a systemic risk. If you pull at any one part of it, if you let Lehman Brothers collapse or something, then other parts begin to suffer, suffer and things can go wrong. Part of this picture is also obscure counterparties. Who, not knowing who you owe money to. You know, if you come to me and say, can I borrow 20 euros, um, I'll pay you that next week, you know who your counterparty is. On the other hand, if you get involved in a credit default swap or any of the new kind of esoteric financial obligations, you're likely not to know, and that's partly because of the person that you borrow from may sell the debt to somebody else. Right? So the mortgage-backed security version of this, and I promise I won't go into a long technical account of mortgage-backed securities, the mortgage-backed security version of this is that it used to be the case that to borrow money to buy a house, you talked to your local banker. You looked him in the eye. He gathered a bunch of information about you. He tried to figure out whether you were a good credit risk and whether you would pay him back the money to borrow a house. The result was that he often didn't loan you the money. Right? It's harder to buy a house. What changed is that the selling of the debt became a profitable business through a <coughs> securitization. So that instead of just bankers selling you money, there were a variety of credit companies. Instead of looking you in the eye and getting a lot of information to find out if you were credit worthy, they basically said, sign here, whether you could afford to pay or not. And when you did that, they didn't worry about whether you could afford to pay, because by the time of the beginning of the financial crisis, the majority of mortgages were being resold almost immediately on issuance. And they were being packed into these mortgage-backed securities. In other words, let's imagine I'm a salesperson, right? Countrywide financial services, and I sell thousands and thousands of mortgages. I take, say, 20,000 of them, and I bundle them together 
as something that's now a tradable security. And you can buy shares in my security. So I've got 20,000 people who owe me money, right? But now they owe just to this debt pool. Shares are sold, it's sliced into lots of little pieces. So there's nobody in particular you owe money to, right? Or the way around who owes money to you. It's linked into this. And this can be traded, right? It can be sold by one bank to another bank to another bank to another bank. And small shares of it can be sold, linking all kinds of people together. Pension funds which buy this and then wind up with deficits. All sorts of things go on with this. So not only tight linkages, but obscure counterparties become part of systemic risk, not knowing, right? Lack of transparency. And this happens even without outright lying, though outright lying is also often a part of these systemic risk crises, that is lack of disclosure. What is the basic definition of a hedge fund? Right? Not any kind of investment, even hedging. Right? It is not having to disclose investments. The basic definition of a hedge fund is a fund that takes people's money, invests it, gives them some kind of return, but does not disclose the positions it takes so that it can do things like bet heavily against a company and hope to drive it into bankruptcy, or heavily in favor of a company and hope its stock will go up or there'll be a takeover or a merger or all kinds of other investments. Um, and this leads then to the final feature, overvalued assets. Right? Um, that is, um, for asset bubbles, right? Well, housing that costs too much should be a familiar story. Right? You get um, some kind of asset, usually, back, usually driven up by the fact that you can buy it on credit, right? <laughs> to the point where there is no market for it, and it becomes hard to make it liquid. So if you owned a house that you thought was worth 500,000 euros, right? and the market crashes, you can't get your 50,000 pound down payment back out of it. Right? That's illiquidity. It right? becomes an asset bubble. Now, all of this is exacerbated by a bunch of other things, like debt leverage. Right? And let me just give you the quick takeaway on this. Um, 40 years ago, in the middle 1970s, about 25% of wealth was held in the form of financial instruments. The rest was in the form of something concrete, a house, a factory, whatever. Right? By the time of the financial crisis, and it's still true today, more than 75% was held in the form of debt. It's held in the form of financial instruments. So we inverted the percentage. We went from being overwhelmingly stuff, physical stuff, to overwhelmingly debt and credit, creating conditions for massive financial problems. Gambling is part of it, right? The buying and selling in this in speculative markets, outright gambling um, in many ways. Over-reliance on derivatives markets. You all know derivatives, that is, um, markets that are constructed where um, the price of some third of the thing determines it. You can have a derivative market in anything. You can have a derivative market in the weather, right? Um, I can sell shares that are essentially a bet on it raining next weekend or not. Right? You can do it on sports, but more importantly, you do it on crops. You sell futures markets. And on a whole series of other kinds of things, like what will the debt rate, the interest rate be next year? Right? So all of these kinds of things. And I'm going to shift out of trying to explain the details of all of this, because the heart of it is financialization. It's what I just said about the 25% to 75%. We have rather dramatically changed the character of capitalism by turning it into an overwhelmingly financial system. Right? Um, with that being the primary driver, this has led globalizations, this has led flows of overseas cap uh, capital. This is the story equally of the good news of the Celtic Tiger years and the bad news of the crisis. Right? Both are shaped by this massive financialization um, that takes place in all of this. This weakens government capacity to be able to manage national economies as well as systemic risk in all of this. Um, and moreover, most of the technologies of risk management, most of what you're, you study if you try to study in finance how to mitigate risk, actually involve um, concentrating risks at higher levels. They don't involve eliminating the risks. Sometimes they involve diffusing the risk more widely. So um, we need to be clear about what's happening to this, but equally that this doesn't necessarily bring the collapse of capitalism. You might ask, why do we talk of a collapse of capitalism? Is it something that's misleading? Now, 
I believe capitalism could collapse, but it's extremely unlikely. Um, collapse isn't quite the mix from a systemic crisis. It's not quite the right metaphor. Right? The image of collapse may be misleading. An all at once short term event could bring down a political regime or a corporate structure. Lehman Brothers collapsed. Right? Capitalism, so sure. The Soviet Union collapsed, but the Soviet Union was a state. Right? A corporate entity of a kind, a state, can collapse in a way, I'm not sure a whole system like capitalism does. There are many examples where we use the word collapse, but there really are long-term transformations. For example, right, the collapse of the Roman Empire took 300 years. It was not something that happened over a long weekend, like the financial crisis. Right? It's a period of long-scale transformation that looks later like it's sudden. The collapse of feudalism is often discussed. Right? But again, we're talking about hundreds of years of social transformation, not a sudden collapse. I think that what we're talking about if we talk about capitalism collapsing ought to be seen the same way. What we're talking about is a long transformation, lots of it not particularly pretty or pleasant, in which there it is the emergence of a number of other ways of doing things that might cohere into a new system. But don't expect overnight transformation um, in that sense. In fact, it's not the collapse of capitalism, but the problems with business as usual in capitalism that are the biggest problems. So move on. Capitalism, fourth point, capitalism is a machine for producing externalities. For economists, externalities just mean costs that a business produces but doesn't have to pay for. It can externalize them. So capitalist firms depend on the capacity to externalize some of their costs. Capitalism only works if you can do this. This is malfeasance. I'm not talking about crime or cheating. I'm saying this is the only way it can work. The system generating all the growth that we enjoy depends on individual firms being able to externalize some of their costs, including the production of ilf that I talked about. Pollution and environmental degradation. Firms never pay for all of the costs of this kind of thing. It's borne by a wider public. It's borne by the people who live nearby and suffer, or it's borne by governments that pay for cleanups, sometimes by industry-wide firms, uh, funds, but not by individual firms. The costs of education, or health care, or other public services. Corporations pay taxes, but they almost never pay the entire cost of what they depend on for skilled workers in terms of having an education system. Um, or health system for healthy workers, and the costs of social disruption and change. The very success of capitalism requires us to adjust to constant change. Capitalism can't work without innovation. It can't stand still. So we're always inventing new things, inventing new products. We experience that in various ways. It's good stuff. Oh, cool. Now I've got the new iPad. We have a, an appreciation for the innovation. But it is also doing things like constantly putting some people out of work because we stop buying the stuff that their factory manufactured um, and we buy something else, possibly made in China. And the um, system of this constant change right, requires, imposes costs. Right? People have to adjust. Families have to help their family members who are out of work in these transitions. Um, communities have to bear the costs of not having the tax base they used to have. That in a whole series of ways, the very pace of change is a cost. Now, that there is externalization it doesn't say anything about whether in the aggregate wealth creation exceed, exceeds costs. It may well be that capitalism produces more wealth than the society has to pay in costs. That's not the point. It's that no firm right, has to pay all of its own costs, individual company, and there won't work if you do. Um, and the issue then becomes distributive. This is part of why you get so much inequality. And it's part of why you have incentives for firms to behave somewhat problematically, to do things like pollute, because they won't pay the whole cost of polluting. So decision making becomes very much influenced by this. We end up with more ill, more bad stuff. The externalized costs of capitalist business, right, these problems could be paid for in a lot of ways. 
They can be paid for by governments. They can be paid for by philanthropy and charities. Churches paid for a lot of this, a lot of time. The church has been an important payer for externalities, like education and healthcare, um, rather than charging firms for this. There is a long trend towards building state institutions to bear the externalized cost of capitalist enterprise, especially during the 30 glorious years following World War II. In other words, capitalism grew rapidly, the world got wealthier, right? and states created institutions like public education to be able to supply educated workers, like the healthcare system, Various versions of national health insurance are direct provision of this. Much of what is meant by the term neoliberalism is the reversal of this trend. From World War II to about 1974-75, there was an expansion throughout the OECD, throughout the richer countries of the world, in the provision of state public services, institutions with state. Just think of public education as an example. Go on to others. All right, goes up. Since 1974-75, that is the period of the biggest recession between the Great Depression and our current crisis, there has been a decline. There has been an unraveling of that. Austerity programs didn't begin with the crisis. Austerity programs began in the 70s. Um, the neoliberal project, uh, tested out in Chile after the Pinochet Revolution, carried on by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, is a large-scale project of rolling back the cost of the states. Now, um, this involved, among other things, a reprivatization of risk. Many of those state institutions involved collective ways of providing for risk. Simple example, unemployment. If there's continual technological progress, which we might all want, some people are going to be unemployed at any time. Should there be some unemployment insurance, which has the society as a whole taking care of the people who suffer unemployment at any one period of time, the assumption that others could have had that problem, and nobody knew, right? Or should the individuals who happen to suffer the unemployment bear the full consequences themselves with no support from the state? So we had a long period of increasing the extent to which there was collective support in almost every area of life. And we've had a long period of dismantling that, putting the risk on children, families, and individuals again, as it was most of the time before that. The risk of the actuality of financial crisis takes this form. Risks that are created in the accumulation of private wealth right, become costs to states and to ordinary people. And this is illustrated in various ways in the way European countries, this one included, assumed the financial risk of privately owned businesses, especially banks, in public debt and sovereign risks. It's a complicated sentence. What's the point? When the financial crisis hit, it hit private banks, primarily. Private lenders, private development companies. And governments decided that in order to maintain the collective welfare, they should turn those private debts into public debts. So throughout Europe, the risky assets, the so-called toxic assets of banks, that is, they were owed money but by people who were now insolvent, were taken over by states. So what had been a private crisis becomes a public one. Well, think of that as a symbol for a more widespread privatization that goes on who will bear risks. Similarly, actors whose excessive risk-taking brought financial markets to their knees only bore a fraction of the risks of personal hardship or actions created. Notice most of the people who suffer in the financial crisis didn't have many financial assets in the first place and certainly didn't have decision-making control in big investment banks. Right? But they bear a lot of the costs. Now, you could say that's unjust, and indeed injustice is one of the issues. But it's not just that it's unjust, it's that it's also a bad incentive. It gives some people the incentive to gamble because the people who pay the costs of a bad bet won't be them, primarily. It will be distributed more widely than that incentive. <laughs> Such approaches to risk management might, might not succeed. So it looks like we're going to come out of the recession. Governments buying up all this assets will work. It stopped the world from sinking into a deeper economic crisis. Right? So congratulate the governments on that. 
but it will have distributive effects. It makes some people pay more of the cost than others. And the distributive effects of the remedies to the financial crisis are as unequal as the original profit making that led to the financial crisis was. Most of the transfer payments are transfers from the less well off to the more well off. We complain a lot about taxes and imagine that this is supporting the poor, but lots of this is supporting the well off individuals or corporations. So not just effective or not, they're distributive. Now, this is one reason, not the only one, but a very major one, why returns to capital tend almost always to exceed returns to labor. This is the big point of Thomas Piketty in Capital in the 21st Century, a book that's been the, the most talked about book. I'm not sure it's been the most read book in recent economics, but it's a book that everybody buys and puts on their coffee table and has an opinion about um, in recent years. And a core part of the book is saying that the return to capital exceeds the return on labor. What does that mean? It means you get more money back for having an investable asset than for working. And this has been the consistent trend, it shows with great statistical evidence, for a long period of time. So that we basically have a system of capitalism that produces inequality. Without interventions, there won't be. Now, let me um, sort of speed up the presentation here. So capital production, capital intensive production, adds to the issue here. We have net job loss, we have automation lose jobs, we have a lot of things. What we have is basically a system of producing inequality. I'm going to try to explain parts of this that left to itself, capitalism will produce more wealth, but it will distribute it unequally. And the rate of inequality growth will be faster than the rate of wealth growth. Okay? And this has been true all of the time of capitalism, except when there has been a state intervention to counteract it or during war, which actually destroys lots of wealth. Now, what would threaten capitalism? Well, insurrection, a rebellion, a revolution to the barricades. Except, eh, not so many people went to the barricades. The striking feature of the politics of the financial crisis has been that there has been no insurrection. Right? The major movements and insurrections in the world have been in places like you know, Asia, and that didn't turn out so well. They have not been the movements. Yes, there was Occupy in Occupy Wall Street and various analogs. Yes, there were protesters in the Plaza del Sol and St. Hockman Square. But these were not insurrections against capitalism. For the most part, these were complaints against governments that people thought weren't managing things well um, in this. And protest isn't the same thing as trying to bring about an alternative by revolution. So this is actually sort of newsworthy. No insurrectionary efforts of any scale. Europe has a huge economic crisis. And there are no real movements to transform it. I don't mean there are no individuals. There aren't a few people, or there aren't anarchists, and there aren't others who have ideas. But there is no, this is the first time in 200 years that Europe has experienced a major financial crisis without insurrection. Right? In all other major financial crises, 1848, right, and various 1871, these are all periods of international financial crisis marked by revolution, the Great Depression, right? The period just before World War I, its revolutions, right? There is no widespread belief in an alternative. There is no widespread movement to put in place an alternative to capitalism, which is a dramatic change in European history. And where there have been rebellions, the biggest and most successful aren't anarchists with opposition to capitalism. They are nationalist, populist nationalist movements. It's Five Star in Italy, it's, it's Golden Dawn in Greece. It's a range of um, more or less right-wing nationalist movements that have been the biggest factor. Now, they may be channeling discontent here, but they aren't anti-capitalist parties as such in this. And around the world, even where class is a factor, nationalism and religion are more often the vocabulary as a struggle today. So insurrection can matter, but the big story here is the dog that didn't bark, that there is no large-scale anti-capitalist movement. This is part of what I mean by it takes root more widely. You might think there would be protests because of how many people lost their jobs, their houses, their savings, but there's a lot less than we would expect. Instability 
and weak social cohesion are another threat to capitalism, perhaps more profound than the threat of insurrection. If insurrection is rare, instability and weakened social institutions are not. Unemployment is widespread, and this is not obviously all cyclical. Some of it is down to automation, some of it is down to changing structural factors in unemployment, some of it is down to international competition. Moreover, much of the employment that exists is precarious. So we have a growing population in very precarious economic positions without much security of long-term employment. Even think of the fate of corporations. One of the interesting features of the last 30-some uh, years has been the extent to which corporations have themselves become commodities bought and sold, and with them the long-term career employment prospects of people working for those firms. Right? So mergers, acquisitions, leverage buyouts, buying and selling companies. What this means is that it is now relatively uncommon for people to spend their whole career working for a firm. It used to be much more the norm. And you had a stability of expectations. So there's precarious employment. There's a state provision of social support that's been weakened. Um, and among capitalism's externalized costs, it's very innovation keeps disrupting ways of life. So this is an issue, an occasion for struggle. Great. Um, Karl Polanyi talked about this in what he called the double movement, already looking at 19th century, right in the middle of the 20th century, and looking at the 19th, he said, it's always the case that capitalism disrupts, tears apart traditional communities. It destroys certain um, skills as meaningful. So if you were a buggy manufacturer in the days of horse and buggies, and automobiles come in, you lose some progress, brings that cost. There's always a time lag before there's a response. The response has generally been the building of new institutions to replace the old, for example, new state welfare institutions that created the welfare states, um, and a variety of unions, for example. Well, we're at a point now where we face a massive institutional deficit worldwide. We are really short on social institutions to deal collectively with even good times and the disruptions capitalism causes, let alone crises. And there are lots of this, issues. The um, issue of institutional deficit appears in the rich countries of the world because governments have been having austerity programs and rolling back institutions. It appears in the former communist countries because of the transition away which destroyed the old institutions, the old health care systems, without immediately producing new ones. It appears in poor countries that are upwardly mobile because they haven't yet built the institutions. But around the world, we face a deficit of institutions. One of the most basic threats to capitalism and human welfare in the world is this destruction of social institutions to move on. And the institutional deficits become often the occasions for informal economies. The way people cope, and it's been very important in the crisis, is through informal, non-institutionalized structures of sharing within families, barter and exchange relationships where there's no money and no formal taxation, um, cooperatives. Um, there are even the spread of alternative forms of money. But most of these don't scale up. They don't produce a different system. They produce coping mechanisms for local communities and individuals. The informal sector can be a kind of attractive thing, an incubator for creative industry. It can be co-opted by large-scale profit-seeking capitalism, but it also opens a way to a bunch of other problems. Weak institutions allow for crime to flourish, including large-scale institutionalized capitalism. And this can be on a huge scale, crossword, including various forms of trafficking in weapons, in drugs, in people, as in the human sex trade. And there's been a massive increase of this during this same period of financial goods, mingling in various ways with legitimate capital business as the money can flow financially from one into the other fluidly. And we're talking about many, many trillions of euros, of possibly as much as a quarter of global capitalist production being at least partially entangled the illegitimate economy of warlords and of militias, gangs, firms operating outside normal illegal channels, and the state corruption that comes with this. So capitalism is threatened by this. It's bad for us in ordinary times, but it also undermines the system. It's a drag on the system um, in various ways. States still matter. One of the morals of the story here is states play a crucial role 
creating new institutions. And if states don't build institutions, we have to ask how else people cope. Can the families do enough? At what point do the coping mechanisms shade over into various forms of dependence on illicit organizations and capitalism? How does care get distributed and so forth? Now, ran out of time, so be quick. Fortunately, I tend to be quick here. There are a lot of other major challenges, and let me just point to these. I've now laid the foundation for pointing to them fast. Right? So, capitalist success has produced devastating externality in the form of environmental damage. Climate change is the big headline here. It's huge, it's enormous, it's happening fast, and it's driven by the growth machine of capital in this by successful capitalism, not by something bad in capitalism, but by it doing its growth job, we have a climate change problem. But we have very little capacity, it appears, to address this. That is, we have this massive problem, but we have undermined the institutional structures we would need to be able to respond to the problem. We are not getting interstate cooperation. We are not getting, even within states, the local cooperation with local areas. We're not responding. In fact, water may be at least as urgent as climate change. One of the big debates in environmental analysis right now is whether we will all be toast from climate change or really thirsty from lack of drinking water first. Right? Our clean drinking water resources may be disappearing faster. Issues like providing user charges for drinking water are byproducts of this. And the fact that water has been massively underpriced um, almost everywhere for a long period of time. The um, climate change, things like don't allow for partial local solutions. The time frame is short, you can only be dealt with globally. So, big deal. Second big deal, geography, geopolitics even, uneven capitalist development. The downside of globalization creates huge risks of war. In fact, not just risks, you may have noticed war. Fairly large scale war looks kind of disconnected because sometimes people say the Ukraine and sometimes it's Syria and sometimes it's Iraq and sometimes. In fact, a very large zone of instability that is at risk of pulling in more and more and wider and wider actors. But not just that, issues in East Asia between China and its neighbors, struggles elsewhere. We have a growing pattern of global conflict. Capitalism is threatened by it, and our ways of life are threatened by it. The Ukraine, Iraq, Syria story, conflicts on the frontiers of old empires, issues in some of the world's resource-rich states, like Nigeria, right, where what was becoming a rapid growth story, a positive growth story in Nigeria, is threatened by a series of internal conflicts, most, low, most notably Boko Haram, but not only Afghanistan, Syria, the Middle East, and the whole of Nigeria, too, show elements of religious conflict, an organization of religious terms that is significant. The world faces a scale of refugees that it has not seen since World War II. There are more refugees in the world now, more people outside their home states as refugees than there have been since the rise of the Nazis and the beginning of World War II. Right? This is a dramatic thing to which there is no dramatic response. Right? And we are failing to respond to this in comparably dramatic terms. Migrations are ubiquitous, they upset local politics, they create these right-wing responses, and yet they're deeply challenging. Right? So how can you produce order in this situation? What can you do when there's a sort of breakdown of hegemony, breakdown of stable production, all of this? Well, the answer presumably is some kind of cooperative structure, of multilateralism and so forth, yet we're not producing it. We're seeing weakening of these structures at the same time. So I could end by saying, oh, let's re-strength, let's strengthen the UN. But actually, I think, well, that's a good idea. It misses part of the story. These various trends that I've been describing all connect the world through capitalist trade, through debt, through <coughs> investment, right, in various ways but don't produce connections that are able to generate political responses and social institutional solutions to these problems. Where we are seeing some building of institutions is mostly in Asia and to some extent in other rapidly developing countries and often on a regional basis. Southeast Asia is a very effective story right now, borrowing lessons from the EU playbook at a time when the EU is not doing so well. 
the ASEAN countries are. Um, the AU is a significant movement toward an African, a renewal of a kind of pan-African spirit long in decline. So, quick moral, these are global problems. The solutions may be partly regional and very largely national. This is the note I want to end on. The paths for transforming capitalism itself and coping with these challenges, maintaining prosperity, but dealing with the big externalities like environmental damage, mostly depend on states, on individual countries and their governments. We have spent a lot of time in recent years talking about how good it is to be cosmopolitan and global. Assuming that all versions of nationalism or national loyalties are bad, and yet it turns out that the institutional structures most able to cope with the threats we face are nation states, most able to respond effectively on a large enough scale. Economies need stabilization. They need vitality. They need the complement of non-economic institutions. So I would suggest states are crucial. We need state institutions. We need to deliver public goods through state institutions to deal with the public bads. But this can come in one of two forms, my last point. It can come in the way that we imagine in Ireland, or the UK, or the US, or various such countries. There is a continuation of the democratic process, and we get governments who do a bit better at building institutions again. We have had such governments in the past have built stronger safety nets, lost some of them. We may be able to build them up again. Liberal democracy may prosper. But a bigger story may be that the very idea of capitalism and liberal democracy going together isn't the whole story. That state capitalism may become a dominant player. That China may actually be more the model of the future. In which what happens is that capitalism is protected that all of these threats I've been talking about are dealt with by a state which does not try to perpetuate the liberal freedoms or democracy of our states, but that tries to achieve stability, achieve growth, achieve protections of some kind of welfare, but does it through a state capitalist control of the economy and collapsing the distinction that I said at the outset had been characteristic between politics and economics into one. If I had to bet money on it, that's what I'd bet on. Thank you. OK, guys, we still have uh, some time for questions. We have to be out of here in about 20 minutes for a simple reason. And Craig still has to catch a flight back to London later on. And, uh, he will be very angry with me if I don't get him on the taxi to the airport. So we have about 20 minutes or so. Uh, could I please ask those who have questions to come down to the podium and speak into the podium for the simple reason that we're actually recording this. So if you could please come down here to the right or to the left side if you have a question. And disagree with uh, Craig, including your conclusion about the state capitalism. But you talked a bit about political power at one time, but the whole point about power, and of course you implied it, is that it's all pervasive. Wherever there is any interdependence, there is a power relationship. And the bigger trend may be towards greater inequalities of power. You alluded without mentioning directly to the city. Citizens United decision, which means that American corporations can now uh, spend unlimited amounts. And the uh, Supreme Court is busy uh, redesigning the Constitution to favor the top thousand, the one thousandth of Americans who actually uh, gain most of the uh, advantage from recent growth. Um, but the whole, I think the whole problem of the world may be simply that we assumed democratic, liberal Democrats always assumed somehow that it was onwards and upwards for greater equality of political participation and power. In fact, the biggest trend is the opposite towards a greater concentration of power. And 
Paul Doyle has said a generation ago that uh, the power was the ability not to listen and not to learn. Uh, and I would just picking up your last point and linking it to the point, the more general point I made. One of the problems in the world is that there is an enormous amount of power concentrated in the hands, not just of international plutocrats, but in one state, the state from which you come, the United States of America. And it's increasingly difficult for the states that you look to to repair institutions to do it when the rules of the game are set by a neoliberal America. End of sermon. All right. I feel I should pray at the end of this sermon. <laughs> the, um, let me just make two comments. So I, I, by most of this, I'll, I'll qualify in, in two ways. There are lots we can talk about. One is with regard to Carl Deutsch's comment. I actually think the rich and powerful learn a lot, and that one of the issues is they learn relatively fast, they deploy this knowledge effectively, and that, that we often don't. Um, the popular, of course, don't always. Um, you may remember various protests outside WTO meetings in which people were saying, wow, the internet is going to empower everybody because we used the web to generate activists and they all went to Seattle and protest, they all went to Genoa and protest the WTO and people didn't think about the fact, gee, isn't the internet available to the capitalists too? Isn't it available to the companies? And gee, it turns out not only is it available to them, they can employ a whole army of information system specialists to deploy it that in fact it can be used more effectively to shore up power. It doesn't automatically empower the masses. Um, and in general, I think there's lots of learning by power. What there is not necessarily is a putting of that knowledge to work fixing the problems we would like fixed, like climate change or something, but that, um, and that it exacerbates inequalities. And I completely agree that there are inequalities of power behind this. And, and um, not just inequalities of, of wealth. It is not the case with this inequality as well. Um, and if I didn't make that clear, I certainly agree that. The second point about America. So yes and no. Of course America is the problem that you describe. I'm going to quibble over the idea of when you say increasingly so. Because I think it's decreasingly so. I think that actually US hegemony um, over the world system is breaking up. Um, so that the pattern is not of increasing American power, the pattern is of American decline. The question is, will the U.S. decline gracefully mm. or violently and problematically, uh, but it's going to lose some of its grip. Now, this doesn't mean Americans will all become poverty stricken. I mean, the decline in that sense um, doesn't have to be in absolute terms. So America will remain a wealthy country, it will remain powerful. Um, it is losing some of its um, capacity to be the world's sheriff, at his, as it has sometimes tried to be. And part of that is an economic capacity. It's too expensive to do all that it might want to do militarily. But it's still by far the world's strongest military power. Right? And how it will use that is a big and very scary question, I think, going back to war. Um, in the Middle East is a very unfortunate sign of this. Um, but I think the loss of hegemony in the world is something to think about because as much as US power may be problematic, there is a stabilizing effect of having a hegemon, that is of having one country um, that is able more or less to keep the system to a set of rules. The bad news is there are the rules that favor it disproportionately, and that's not fair. The good news is that there are sort of rules well, what happens to the breakup? Does it mean China becomes the next hegemon? Does it mean that there's no hegemon? Does it mean that there's some multilateral coalition? Well, the last time there was a weakened hegemon and a struggle over who was in charge was a hundred years ago. And it lasted for approximately 40 um, years. Um, and it was World War I and the Great Depression and World War II. So the decline of the US power should not make us optimistic that we get freedom. It should make us pessimistic that we get world disorder and worried about how we build alternative institutional structures, 
including international governance structures and agreements, not only, to deal with that threat. Because if there is a major conflict over who's the greater power, that's bad for everybody. Okay, can we just use a zipper system? So can you raise your question? Keep your concise, short, please. And then we have you, and then you. And can we gather the three, and then you might yeah. come with a yeah. code? Okay. Please, so, so as short as possible. Yeah. So you talked about how capitalism and growth is what has affected global warming and all of that. So there's also many proponents that say that growth, which we see as currently good, comes from capitalism, and thus the solution would be a steady state economy. What do you think about that type of economy? Okay. Just taking that. Um, I had a question about the, the lack of insurgency, the lack of kind of counter movements yeah. uh, against the latest crisis. Uh, my question is: Do you think that financialization has contributed to a sort of abstraction of capitalism? That means we're not sure what we're insurrecting against. And yeah. So yeah. So having read your um, your bit on the limits, uh, I guess my question is: Is you go you go through a fair amount of historical analysis? Uh, in regards to, say, the Roman Empire and feudalism. But to what extent is this historical analysis useful or even applicable, given the fact that capitalism is an entirely different mode of production, which, in the same breath that you were talking about it, you mentioned that it has suffered from crises, tendencies that seem to um, get bigger over a wider space and deeper over time. So how come it's not the internal contradiction of capitalism itself that you focus on, rather than you know, these sorts of historical analysis to justify your conclusion? Okay. Yep. Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah. I talked about um, the delivering public goods through state institutions. So my question is, what are the characteristics of the state that makes them fit to deliver these public goods, public solutions, and why not international or supranational bodies or entities? Okay, thank you. Can we take one more? Yep. Okay. I just have one thought to have a question from Roma. And also, uh, I, I just want to ask you, so, is your conclusion nothing threatens capitalism? Okay. Is that it? Come on. Okay. Let me try to respond. to the microphone. I'll try to respond to these in order and quickly. Steady state economy not possible as capitalism would require transcending capitalism into something else. We haven't been building the something else, so I'm not expecting it to happen very soon. Um, this is exactly the sort of thing that an insurrection might have been pushing. That is, there might have been a global movement for a steady state economy. There are books written about it. There are people talking about it. I see very little matching of the vague hope to actual power. Um, and therefore, I'm not very optimistic about generated this now. The idea of a steady state economy is an entirely plausible notion. It seems there's nothing wrong with it. It's not, however, something achievable within the basic frameworks of capitalism, as I was trying to hint, all laid out, all organized for growth. Um, and, um, and in fact, to make the attempt at steady state become a relative decline. Um, the uh, abstraction point is a very good point in this regard as to why we don't get that. I think that the question of who you would oppose and how you would organize an insurrection is a very basic question. And capital is very abstract and distant, even government is. So if we think of revolutions and major insurrections, they often um, were successful in settings where there was a clear physical location of power. If you marched on the Hotel de Ville in Paris, you could take over. Um, and that doesn't exist so clearly in this system, and that's one of the weakening features for potential insurrection, which is partly why I think we're not going to see the change come by by a revolution. Um, we had better work on other institution building processes of transformation. Um, historical analogies are always limited. What I'm trying to, to um, illustrate with them, though, is that I think the current situation is one in which the analogies and the potential for transcending it, whether to get a steady state economy or other good futures, is dependent on a, a 
long-term transformation, which is political and, if you will, civilizational, um, as well as narrowly economic. Um, and um, therefore, the analogies to feudalism of the Roman Empire aren't that we're in a situation just like feudalism or just like the Roman Empire. They are that um, talking about changing capitalism is talking about something big and complicated that would not change overnight, but would take long periods of transformation. Um, the state um, capacity versus international system, I would love to see greater strengths at the international level, and not in any sense against that outcome. What I'm suggesting is that um, for action to be practical, it has to build on a strong starting point. Um, and that uh, we have been much too quick to uh, dismiss the value of uh, existing state institutions when they've had problems, rather than rebuild them. And that this is much more of a foundation to build on, besides which almost all of the international institutional structures are interstate structures, literally international. They are creatures of treaty. Um, that bind the various states to each other. So can we work to build things internationally? Yes, we should. Can we um, possibly confront climate change or systemic risk of global capitalism, all these things, without international structures? Um, no. But will these be global structures organized on some cosmopolitan basis that does not depend on national states or regional agreements among national states? Impossible, in my view. We will have to have a both-and solution getting the national states to be more international um, in their behavior and outlook. Um, and um, I do think capitalism is extremely powerful and resilient, so I actually uh, understand the charge that I might be saying nothing threatens it. But actually, I think these things I talked about threaten it. And um, that what that means is that capitalists um, and here, not just individuals. One of the things I quickly from Steve's presentation, Stephen Manel is right about individuals benefiting, the 1%, the 1,000 families. But it's often institutional structures like corporations or something that, that benefit. But in any case, um, I think that capitalism, the organizations, will take action to meet these challenges on their own terms. And so it's not that nothing threatens it. It's that we have to watch out for what they will do in responding to this and how it will work and whether we like it. And we have to try to steer that because the best bet for having these be better outcomes that have less inequality and benefit more people is to steer the kind of responses. I see no ability to simply overturn it. I do see some ability to steer the kind of responses <coughs> capitalists make. And if you go to in effect, meetings of these uh, the one percent, like the World Economic Forum in Dallas or places like that, you find the one percent talking about these issues, but you find the solutions somewhat different than you might find if you go to an uh, occupy occupation by a popular group. Um, but it's not that these issues aren't on their agenda; they are, um, and they are mostly looking for ways to stabilize a situation that they think is at risk of spinning out of control. Thank you very much. Um,